We live in a fast-paced and hectic world where it's easy to feel overwhelmed, stressed, and out of control. How do you manage all the competing pressures without losing sense of yourself? How do you stay focused enough to not only plot a path, but follow it? Welcome to Master Your Life, a show that offers inspiration, insight, and intelligence, as well as success stories from many walks of life that can show you how you can control your own destiny. Our knowledgeable and entertaining host and her guests give practical advice that you can use every day in the quest to master your life. Now, here's your host, Leah Mattinson. Hi, everyone. I'm host Leah Mattinson, and welcome to today's show of Master Your Life. I'm so glad that each and every one of you has been able to join us from wherever it is that you are on this wonderful planet. Um, today, I'm joined by my guest, Dr. David Hardy. Dr. Dave, welcome to the stage. How are you today? I'm doing great. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. It's, it's always fun chatting with you. So um, you know, we'll, we'll see how serious or how light we get. It, it kind of just depends where, where we take it. I love it. <laughs> That's right. It's like having coffee with good friends, right? So uh, I hope everyone's got their easy chair pulled up or their earbuds in and you've got a pen and paper handy. Uh, ready to take some notes because we want you maybe to be taking in information and writing it down so you can do something with it at the end of uh, the podcast. Or if you have to only listen to part of the podcast and then run because you got stuff to do, then come to the masteryourlife.ca so that you can uh, collect and watch the entire video version or the podcast so you don't miss a thing. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, what is going on in the world in current events, which is the beginning of this horrendous war in the Ukraine. Um, I was watching videos this week, uh, Dr. Dave and I we were just, I was watching videos of little ones and their parents putting them on trains to go to the safety camps or the safety zones. And uh, people go, what does the Ukraine matter? And I'm like, besides the fact that there's human beings that live there, like they're not, they're trying to, it's like people are really trying to puzzle out why this war is happening. And I'm more trying to go, doesn't matter what the reason is, like that's gotta be sorted out. People war and it's this crazy thing, this whole war thing is so insane that we keep doing this over and over and over again, all over the globe. But the consequence to real people, what kind of stories have you seen Dr. Hardy this week? Uh, just, yeah, the, the odd time that I do actually turn into the news. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've just kind of seen once again the, the early stages of everything developing there, and uh, and my heart goes out to the to the people stuck in that situation, and uh, and I I I truly hope that that people are able to to stay safe and and that uh, this conflict is resolved quickly, and uh, and and hopefully that that people are are left to, to live their lives again, but we'll, we'll see what unfolds. Yeah, and so you're going to leave this show today with some real tools to help you to manage your own stress. And maybe you've got relatives in the Ukraine. Maybe you've got people who are reacting emotionally to watching this information on TV or whatever media that they have. Technology is, you know, come it's coming at us all so fast. Um, Dr. David Hardy is at the Collegiate Sports Center in Red Deer, Alberta, Canada. Red Deer, Alberta, Canada, and I am in Cameras, Alberta, Canada. So we just went through this crazy Emergency Measures Act being invoked. The trucker convoy has just, you know, been the last three weeks. So just to give it a context for what's been going on. And like Dr. Dave, I don't watch much for news, but I have people that feed me sort of the, you know, the intel that I need to be able to do my job properly, which is to coach people around health advice and calmness and you know calming down their central nervous system, that kind of thing. So as I'm getting these very high level, true accounts of what is going on in the ground, both in Canada, worldwide, and now in the Ukraine, I think I'm just getting these snippets because I know to shut off the technology to protect my brain, but most people don't even know that simple strategy. And so I want to, to give Dr. Dave an opportunity just to talk about really what happens with the brain when it's under so much fire all the time. And then we can talk later in the episode about how people can take back control of that neurological health, calmness, 
and balance. So Dr. Dave, how is it that people actually their brain or and then their behavior is in response to these really critical life changing events that are outside their external control? Right. Uh, basically, what's going to happen is you're going to light up that fight or flight area of the brain, and that's going to signal down to the adrenal glands to pump up, pump out all sorts of stress chemistry, and we're going to be, be flooded with it. So that's an appropriate um, mechanism. The thing is, it's only supposed to happen basically when we're in an immediate danger. So that, that response saves us from, from the, the tiger or, or whatever uh, situation is, is deadly and dangerous at that moment. But the prolonged stress is just where the damage happens. And yeah, the old saying, neurons that fire together, wire together, uh, definitely... <laughs> is what's happening in these stressful situations is you're firing into these systems that keep us alert and hyper vigilant and in the intensity of it also really gets the neurons to wire together so you, you get this part of the brain that just becomes overactive and becomes more and more efficient at doing it and then of course all the other functions start to go to the wayside and then, of course, too, it's firing down to tell the adrenal glands that there's a threat situation and it's pumping out all these stress chemistry again. And uh, adrenaline is what's called a glucocorticoid, so a sugar hormone. So you need sugar when you're alert. So then, of course, uh, the, the sugar and insulin systems can also start to kind of downregulate as well too much cortisol being flooded out into the systems going to cause once again upregulation and downregulation of receptors. So it just becomes this chemical and neurologic bath of just once again, things that don't need to be prolonged in our body. And uh, the more and more that response goes on, the more and more damage happens to that person. So. Yes. Um, then it kind of leads into PTSD later too, because you've got this system that's so overactive and able to be always on alert. And that means later on, it's going to be set off by little things that you, you never thought would set that system off or that a normal individual wouldn't respond to. So the prolonged effects for, for these people are, are horrendous as well. And it just becomes maddening. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just frontline workers, firemen, uh, good police officers uh, that are getting PTSD. It is the general population? The general population is getting it more and more now. And uh, those diagnoses are, are skyrocketing as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it's most likely due to a lot of the, the prolonged stress that we we afflict on our fellow human beings mm -hmm. and uh, if that system becomes hardwired and more and more efficient and plastic then yeah the, the responses to this outside stimuli coming in is going to set people off quicker and and more efficiently all the time and yeah we're starting to see that and it's it's not not a good thing so we got to look at strategies later on to, to help to calm down the nervous system of people mm -hmm. so. i think one of the saddest things is that you can't see this damage you know so most people are you know walking through life looking at other people and going well they look okay <laughs> and there doesn't seem to be anything going on they look okay they look okay but the truth is there's lots of stuff going on under the hood. And so when it's like when I got the genetic status there, however many years ago now, I was I learned this that saying, what wires together, fires together. And I took that to heart to do things that wired and fired together that were good. Like I did a lot of activities that were um, good for my brain health, you know, meditation and on the treadmill, meditation, envisioning my 
brain actually healing itself as I was walking. So there was this increased amplitude of um, energy, uh, yeah, blood pumping, seeing a, seeing a healthy, happy brain, seeing all these little Ziggy light construction characters actually rebuilding all my neural wiring. And so I, I was doing that as a, you know, on a regular basis. So that's an easy thing from a practice for me that I can still do now. But yeah. I wasn't sitting in meditation. I was doing it on a treadmill. You know, so there's this kind of difference where I was bringing it into the mm -hmm. real world and amping up my uh, heart rate. So getting the blood that pumping. Is, that is an amazing good point right there is that, yeah, when you're starting to produce all this stress chemistry within your body is to actually use it. So remember, if we go back into evolution or, or down into other animals, when they get a stress response, they run away or they fight. That's why it's called flight or fight. And if you just sit there and do nothing, all that stress chemistry is just left there to sit in the body and it's not being used. So if you're able to actually exercise and get the heart rate up and to actually do something physical, then you're using up and burning off some of the, the stress chemistry that was actually you know, kind of what it was meant to, meant to be used for, get you out of that situation or get you able to, to fight somebody or something off. And uh, this goes back into some of the, the studies that, that I've seen or, or read, lay articles on. And that was that, uh, Sometimes the frontline soldiers come back with less PTSD than some of the, the, the support military personnel. And I think this is kind of one of those mechanisms as well, is that they're able in those situations, you know, obviously very profound situations, to be able to act and to do something. Whereas people who are not in that situation or role are kind of told to just stay in, stay in place and to, and to not, not do anything or to react. And I think in these situations, we've got to, um, got to get people active and burning off that stress chemistry instead of telling them to sit there and to relax. Well, you can't relax in those situations. So you've got to a, psycho, a psychopath can relax. You're, <laughs> you're actually making a pathology. It, people need to really understand how serious this is. That you're making yourself pathological by not expressing the uh, emotion that's there or feeling the emotion. Uh, and so a lot of times in Western culture, we're told to just, oh, rub some dirt in it. Just, you know, it's no big deal. Turn the TV off, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily that effective. Dave, was, what was the consequence? Do you remember from when you were reading the papers? What was the consequence to the soldiers who were sitting in the foxhole when they came back? Um, what were some of the consequences in their real lives when, when these things weren't healed? Or what right. was, how was their experience different than the people who were on the front lines who maybe even had lost a leg, an arm, a, you know, real wounds to the physical body? What, what, was there any mention of that? Um, no, medication once again, that there was more, more diagnoses and I'm not sure if it's more severe diagnosis of, of PTSD that the support personnel were, were equally are very much affected by, by being in this, this tense situation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just found that fascinating. It's just been one of those things that have stuck into my mind. It's like, okay, well, why? They're, they're actually not in that heat of the battle, but um, the, the brain doesn't know a real stress situation from a, from a non, well, or less severe stress situation in that case. Um, that part of the brain's still just going off. And, and uh once again, if you're not able to react to it, then you feel like you have less control as well. So that can ramp it up. So there can be several different mechanisms into why this is occurring. And, and uh, then I think of the, just the general public that, that's just um, constantly, once again, um, being bombarded with all this, this information of, of uh, of horrible events all the time and it's 
it's once again, okay, well, uh, if that person's not able to react or feels less and less in control, then these responses and these systems in the brain, once again, are going to become very efficient and continue to, to have that response. And, uh, you know, overall, it's just, just detrimental to society in, in general, but very much so to that person who's sitting there and watching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so when people are drawing parallels here, just to think about that you've all been in the foxhole, for, you know, everyone's been in the foxhole as a collective for at least two years now. Um, and prior to that, there's lots of people sitting on the sidelines watching the horror that evolves and unfolds on their TVs every single day. Um, so whether it's been intentional or um, unconscious, people have volunteered to put themselves in those frontline positions. Even watching a horror movie will can make your brain just do things that isn't necessarily what, what you want to create in a healthy, happy brain, just as because people think their brain isn't that sensitive, you know, right. like they're not really, they, they, I think people have falsely been trained that their willpower is enough, that willpower, this more willpower thing is going to be the thing that helps me through everything. It's all about willpower. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, that, that's a great way to, to blame people <laughs> right <laughs> right like that that's what you're doing when you when you're talking all about willpower it's it's their decision and that kind of shows that that uh, the knowledge out there in the general public is not high enough to look past just one mechanism into why somebody's not feeling well mm -hmm. and, uh, and suffering so there's, there's several reasons and uh, just the, the talk is not going to necessarily calm down these areas or to, to help correct the physical damage that was done. And there's no magic pill. So there's once again, there's maybe a slower healing process and different ways to rehab the systems in the brain to, to get them get them back eventually to, to some better state. And uh, then of course, on top of it, we've got the, the physical damage of the, of the frontline people. Um, once again, all the sound, the exposure, the shock waves, and all of them are coming back basically with some sort of, sort of brain, brain damage from being in those situations. There's, there's no way around it. So you really need to support all military personnel and, and uh, anyone that's, that's supporting um, anybody in those, those high pressure situations. Does um, it make people more, um, does this kind of brain damage make people more malleable, like more able to influence them? to keep reactivating that part of the brain that's already in that sort of fight mode? It's just a question. I don't know if you have an answer, but it just occurred to me, oh, it's like maybe this is like the hair trigger, you know, where people are angry. It's like the, like a lot of angry people are in the front lines. I, I kind of go back to the, the example of like an aggressive, uh, athlete who who gets gets brain damage well then of course you start to ramp up the centers that that house aggression and those types of emotions so you take somebody who's already aggressive and make that brain a little more unstable then that part of the brain usually becomes triggered easier mm -hmm. and then two if you damage more of this the higher centers that fire down and tell these primitive centers to relax and calm down, don't do that, then you lose that gating mechanism as well. So yeah, if somebody who's been in these horrible situations and who, who come back with, with uh, as some grade of damage to those circuits, once again, yeah, they're, they're more likely to become more irritable and more aggressive and, and um, have more bouts of rage and, and frustration. So you know, 
really needs to be one of those things that that we start diving more into the the abundance of clinical neuroscience that's coming out and actually start to to look more and more at the the rehabilitation side of the the physical damaged parts of the brain um, and that's going to set up the, the counseling and and the relationship sides better too so if you can kind of once again fix the hardware before you try to try to go after the software and the processing side of it then i think we'll we'll set these these folks up for better results and better healing um, and uh and less suffering mm -hmm. and the uh what i encourage people to do is uh, to put like one hand on your head and one hand on your actual, like your heart or your solar plexus, and actually just feel where the differences are in your body, because one is like your brain is under that hand of yours. And that's actually what's driving the entire show. So when people think that it's this heart, the willpower, the, you know, that is part of the part of the thing. But if the brain, which is under your hand, you really need to figure this out. It's like a real, it's a separation. And in allopathic medicine, what they do is they medicate the brain. So you're given antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti whatever. It's an anti-truth serum, <laughs> the anti-truth serum. And so, uh, you know, the, the fixing of the whole system is what is important, but you can't just medicate something that's broken because the medication is not there to heal things, it's to manage symptoms. So yeah, the, medications are there to stabilize a pathology. Um, but what do you mean stabilize a pathology what does that mean it means something has gone so wrong that it needs something extremely powerful to kind of knock it down and uh and it doesn't necessarily it's good in the short term in acute situations where it's absolutely needed mm -hmm. but in the long term we we need to look at the strategies that are going to to build better vibrant healthier um, nervous systems and brains to to deal with the, the physical damage that happens in these situations. Yeah. So let's back up to the beginning of the interview when I said, hey, we're going to talk a little bit about the war in Ukraine, the Emergency Measures Act being instituted in Canada. That has been lifted, but there was people who had their bank accounts seized. Lots of people are nervous about what's going on in the monetary system globally. <clears throat> I think anyone who's not uh, you'd have to be almost comatose to not have some of this stuff going on just as a regular human being. So you don't have to be somebody who's been on the front lines. You don't, we're all on, we're all on the front lines essentially right now. <laughs> so it's like, look, look at thyself and go and know yourself, know thyself so that you can start to su suss out a bit what's going on. Part of the problem though, too, is that if you've got brain damage, neurological damage, you're not necessarily that great a judge of what's going on. Right, because you're looking at yourself going, you might look at yourself and go, well, I'm a little bit touchy or whatever. But meanwhile, everybody that you live with is going, okay, <laughs> walking on eggshells, got to get away from that person. You know, nobody wants to go out with me anymore. <laughs> Those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Do you see that as part of the problem in, in dealing with neurological issues, Dr. Hardy? What do you think about yeah, it becomes one of those downward cascades. Uh, one bad thing leads to a worse bad thing, and it just continues to to circle and go down farther and farther and farther. And yeah, um, it doesn't take much for us as humans to start once again um, getting that declined brain function and becoming once again. Uh, I'm using the term loosely, but animalistic. Mm. So once again, more, more kind of like like a um, reactive and back into those those situations of of uh, less less higher function than that us as humans mm. enjoy and and uh, like to say willpower and give ourselves credit about you know, things like that. But really, it just reverts back to reacting to those quick situations and uh, with previous memories of anything similar to it. So yes. things that we might not even think are similar to a situation like that, but flashing lights and bright sounds and different angles are going to, once again, if something's being 
really intensely wired into the brain mm -hmm. it's going to to set people off and it it becomes one of those things if if uh, the brain continues to be in those situations um, to any degree it's going to reinforce what the brain already knows and does and it, it just becomes once again one of those things that becomes more and more difficult to, to treat mm -hmm. for somebody to deal with. Right. So for, and I, because I've got all these wonderful grandchildren and I've also been lucky enough to have been, uh, had a father who had this Huntington's disease. And for people who haven't listened to our prior episodes, please go and, you know, again, check it out on masteryourlife.ca. We talk about a lot of things, birth to deaths that we're going to just Cole's notes, some of it here. Uh, as opposed to going into the depth that we've talked about some of these things on prior interviews. Um, but with little ones, when they get injuries, uh, if we notice, or if we notice that one person has an injury or something is an odd behavior, and that's an odd thing, then collectively society used to, if they were healthy, a healthy society, a healthy culture, they would look at that person and go, that person needs a little bit of help. But now we've got so many people who are in the same neurological boat. What kind of position does that put us in as a culture? Big time, man. Yeah, we're seeing it with the with, uh, homeless population and, uh, and with uh, uh, the growing numbers of people who are, who are addicts. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people are losing sympathy over, over people that are struggling. Um, as the problem seems to get worse and worse and, and there doesn't doesn't seem like there's there's uh, any progress being made with it so take the example of somebody who's who's on a bus and they look over and see somebody who's who's once again maybe on on a substance at that point in time who's looking dirty and and uh, decrepit and the fear response is going to kick in because it's not going to be the caring, oh, let's get this person better. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be, okay, is my safety at jeopardy here? And the more and more that happens, the, the more and more, once again, uh, there's going to be a backlash against people who are struggling and suffering. Mm -hmm. And things, things aren't going to get better. Um, at the same time, it's this complex issue of, okay, well, how do we keep people safe and how do we actually care for people that are struggling, suffering, and, and going through all these, these issues? And uh, that's, that's a complex, complex issue because we're dealing with so many different uh, factors and, and that's got to be one of the most difficult, um, traditionally difficult uh, healthcare things to treat, and uh, and we're uh, traditionally doing a pretty horrible job at it. <laughs> right, and I love this um, segue, and I want people to take some hope from from this, uh, because the question is, how have we been continuing to treat these things? Most of the uh, treatments have been allopathic. Most of it's go to the doctor and get some medication to fix the thing that you're sick with. And now there's medication for everything. So if people just do a little bit of history, you can look at there was, you know, med mothers were getting medicated with Valium. And then, you know, now to fast forward, the kids were being put on all kinds of drugs to manage their brains, their behaviors. Um, and I won't name those, but you guys know what they are. And so we now have a population of people who have multi-diagnoses of things that are fictional a lot of times, um, but also because there was this complete hijacking of information around uh, lifestyle as medicine and cleaning up your own um, biome, go to the professional, quote unquote, that's going to help you, and then keep going back to them for more um uh, more things that are supposed to help you with your latest condition. So now you're on four, five, six, seven medications. Everyone in your family is on medications. Nobody has any idea what they're doing. And this is now multi-generational. And those are the people that are living on the street. It isn't just the alcoholics. So, you know, it'd be the one town bum that people will go, oh, that guy's 
you know, the town bum and everyone would go, oh, poor old whoever it was. And, they, you know, would feed him and help him out and whatever else. But this is an en masse thing. Uh, a lot of it, I think, because people didn't really understand at, or know because the information has been withheld that you can heal your brain. And when you can heal your brain, you can heal a lot of the other parts of your life. Yeah. You know? So this is a huge is a huge thing when you realize that it isn't all just your lack of willpower, but it's just that your brain is addled, you know? So we, I would joke around with my friends who were ex police and they would have had multiple head injuries from playing hockey when they were young. And, you know, they would be like angry, angry outbursts, angry, this, angry, that. And I said, do you have brain damage? And they're like, well, that's rude. <laughs> like, <laughs> No, it's true. You do, you do, you know? So what are you going to do? Just go right, you know, they go, well, I don't know, because my doctor just said I needed to be on antidepressants and uh, antipsychotics a lot of times, those kinds of things. Like what? Like what about, you know, what about these alternative things? Uh, because maybe the gift of Huntington's disease is really there's nothing that helps it uh, except having a reasonably good lifestyle. So, you, you know, the doctors don't snow you as saying, oh, you know, you can take this medication. It'll help with this. They don't say that. They just say, come back when you're symptomatic. <laughs> right. So, so then you're your own doctor, like you have to figure yourself out. You're your own health manager. Uh, but people had the idea and have been trained to go to their doctor. So even with this current pandemic, you don't look, most people don't look for natural remedies at all. It's like, when can I get my dose of ivermectin? I'm like, man, there's lots of things that can heal you outside of ivermectin, not saying that ivermectin doesn't work. It's awesome. Thank you. Uh, and there's lots of other things that you don't have to wait. So this is the other thing that people think they have to wait for the doctor to stroke the, whatever it is, prescription, the RX, the medication, and that it's led to a group of people who are so, so sick. They've lost everything. Not that many years ago, probably two, well, probably just before COVID started, uh, the, the number one reason for bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy in the U.S. was medical um, bills, medical bills. Like you got, just pause and think about that. So the system that's, system that's supposed to be helping you to be healthy is robbing you of your health and your home, your family of their legacy, you know, so you, they don't have an inheritance. They have an inheritance of a sick, broke parent or grandparent. You know, and so the whole culture is now, it's like, you can see the, I think of the scales, you know, a pair of scales and more and more sick people kind of getting over to the, the side of the scale that isn't that great. And when's the tipping point where there's going to be so many sick people that you actually, you know, you, you can't level it out. You know, so where it used to be, like I say, the town bum, and I say that tongue in cheek, all, I love you all you town bums, that there was one or two of those, you know, so the, the majority of people were sometimes like mostly over here are kind of in the gray area, working hard, taking care of their health. And now it just keeps tipping over, tipping over, tipping over to there being more and more people that are really unwell, but also because they don't think they can be. So what can you tell people about um, what you do, Dr. Dave, that gives people hope or a different path or how they can maybe look at or how it's how you operate differently in the practice that you have i think the the important thing is and that there are all sorts of healing arts that have been around for thousands of years and those are observations people made of if you do this people get better type thing and they've developed into protocols and everything else obviously and and uh, so those have been around for a long, long time. And are they as well researched? Um, well, research has been around for what? Um, 100 plus years, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of research has gone to, once again, um, uh, industries that, that we know now are, are established. And the reason for that was uh, there was a need for it with with uh, different infections and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then of course it was successful with some things and still is. So, um, but you can't use it for everything. And all these other things have kind of were swept aside. And uh, it was just assumed 
um, for a long time that people were eating well and exercising and taking care of themselves because that was kind of the, the job market back then too. People had to be active mm -hmm. and they were doing other things on the sides and stuff. And the food chain was, was better. <laughs> it was yeah. Yes. And, uh, well, now you've taken that away and you're seeing that, well, if you take that away, you can't, can't get, get health back. And, and the, the really amazing thing now though, is, uh, with research, it's kind of starting to take, take a turn and we know more about the brain and nervous system. And then all of a sudden, all of these modalities and healing arts or alternative therapies, uh, all of them start to realize, well, yeah, you're stimulating a receptor that goes someplace in the brain and stimulates that part of the brain. And that's one of the reasons exercise is so good for depression as well. And, and for, for general health is just moving. You're stimulating all these receptors that are sending messages up to the brain and making the brain more alert, active and healthier. And we don't get that same effect from just sitting down and doing a cognitive task because the majority of the brain is a sensory motor organ. Being able to sit down and do cognitive tasks is once again, kind of the upper echelon. And that's where all the strategies and everything has gone to in the past because, well, that was the part where we maybe needed to improve back then because people were moving around, were active, eating well and everything else and stimulating all the other centers of the brain that support cognition. And we're not seeing that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then of course, we're seeing more and more damage to those parts of the brain as well. And then we're still going back to, yeah, willpower and cognition and everything else without looking at the entire system and, and how it's meant to be used and how it's mm -hmm. evolved, if you like that word. Um, but basically how, how the, it was designed. And it's, it's that we got a better picture of that roadmap now of how the nervous system works. Mm -hmm. So then if we've got a better picture of that, then it becomes more efficient and you can match up different modalities to the parts of the brain that aren't functioning as well. Right. And then too, uh, with different technologies, uh, some of those therapies, modalities, alternative things, um, you can actually now with different technologies make more intense so that it wires the brain better. Or you can monitor the brain better so that you don't, exceed what it can handle when you're doing therapies and that just makes the the whole clinical picture more efficient and effective so you're building on thousands of years of knowledge and, and observations and protocols and matching it up with with the science and the roadmap that wasn't available back then and that's where the, the results are starting to happen and take place Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the people who are relying on science 100% to actually figure out their stuff, this is the, uh, the, you can look at the research and all that stuff for people who are um, more in the moment and going, okay, well then what do I do with this? All you need to do is put your hands above your head and take a deep breath, like inhale. And, and I'm just because it's moving your body. So you don't need a gym membership. You don't need a fancy work yoga outfit. You don't need, um, I don't know what else, what else do you need when you're going to the gym? You don't. <laughs> And I'm not saying don't go to the gym, but I'm just saying that you can change that like just so fast. It's so fast. And I, you can snap your fingers, do that. Just snap your fingers. And that changes something neurologically. Do both, do both hands. Yeah. There's, um, and then you have this elevation uh, automatic instant um, feedback from your own body that says, hang on a minute. That felt good. Unless you're sore and you'll still get feedback that says, okay, that hurts. Why does it hurt? When I'm 30 years old and I put my arms above my head and I stretch my hands up, is yeah. that normal for there to be pain in this body at this age? Like, how did that happen? And so 
And even a better question is not the how, but the why. It's like, what is your why for wanting to be well? So when you look out at the world and you see things that are going on that you don't like, uh, you know, whether that's you've got an ill parent or you've got a child that's sick or you've got war going on or you're, you know, you're fighting with your loved one or whatever it is. It's like, what would be your motivating factor for trying to improve yourself so that you can have a better life? Because you're the one that has to figure that out. Nobody else can figure that out for you. I know for me, it's my grandchildren. When I look at them, I just go, oh, I just freaking love you so much. Oh, and I want you to have such a good life. And when I look at those little ones over in the Ukraine right now, and I look at them and go, oh, this just breaks my heart. Um, and then I, when I, because I can feel the emotion of it, because they're, they're right there for me. Then I have to do something. So I do Qigong and I, you know, put my hands above my head and just stretch and go, like send good stuff to them and try to do what you can to be a good human being in your own life today. Like, you know, how can you help? How can you be more sane, Leah Mattinson? So then it's like, insert your own name in what it is that you're trying to do. So maybe you don't have children, maybe you don't have grandchildren, maybe you just, you know, want to see a better society, but you have to figure that out. What do you think are some of the whys that people have for trying to improve what's going on in their life or in their health? Everything stems from good health. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you lose it that that, that really sticks to you. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, everything you enjoy is coming from your perception of the world and from yourself. And if that starts to deteriorate, then your relationships go downhill, your enjoyment goes downhill. All those hobbies that you used to like but no longer do, um, it just tells you once again what's what's happening with yourself and yeah we can get all geeky and talk about different pathways in the brain and modalities and all this but yeah it does come down to to how you feel and if you're letting that slide or you're not even aware that it's sliding because it can be a slow process then things just start to, to go dull gray and the frustration, the anger, all of that starts to build around it. Mm -hmm. And you're not the same person anymore. Yeah. So it really comes down to how we're feeling and well, why can't we improve that and make it feel even better? Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's what we need to, start caring about ourselves and, and people around us so that that it does become more vibrant and healthy and you're able to enjoy things even more and everybody thinks they want that that word happiness and enjoyment and fulfillment and everything else and it all comes down to how healthy you are and and uh if you're not taking care of that or trying to build it, it's going to decline, whether it's slowly or fast. Mm -hmm. it most likely will be slow at first and then speed up. So even if you're feeling healthy, it's you, you got to guard it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a fun and playful dance that Dr. David Hardy and I do each week or each episode because... We are pretty nerdy, both of us. So it's like the, it's, I, I like the measurements and the science and I like seeing, uh, like I do genius biofeedback, um, which is also available at masteryourlife.ca. And I do that um, biofeedback because I can see how I'm doing. Like it gives me feedback in a nice little picture, you know? So for people who like the feedback thing in your own hands, there's tools that are available to do that. And, uh, I, I do think it's like, it's figure out where you can get a toehold in your own life uh, to improve yourself. So whether that's putting your arms above your head or taking a look at a piece of technology that maybe you haven't tried before or considered before, um, it's something to get you interested in your own, tracking your own progress, because we're kind of, uh, I think most people like to track their progress and see improvement. And a lot of people have lost their ability to even do that, you know, so am I better today than I was yesterday? Jeez, I don't know. Am I, you know, so that, and really it's honest, it's like an honest observation, right? So unless you're consciously going, how do I want to improve my health or where do I notice that are, you know, or my relationships or whatever they are, um, 
and especially in grief, we, we lose our, sometimes people can lose their entire legacy when they're in grief or when, and this is a grieving process. It's the same reaction in your body. So, so many countless times in business um, coaching, people who lost their uh, fathers lost their business when they were on the cusp of being successful because they had this loss and their neurology changed. So it's like really important to put the weight on this that, that it deserves to really understand how much your brain can affect your overall, not just day-to-day -day satisfaction, but your success in life. Yeah, because it it's really amazing how, how much it does. Uh, and in a good way, because you can fix it. So Dave, do you want to talk a little bit? We've got about two minutes left, just about what your thoughts are on biofeedback and kind of last words for today. I love it. It's, it's once again, one of those tools we can use to monitor things. So uh, the monitoring part is, is key in, in health and especially with brain health, because the neurons in the brain, they, they're so active and things can change within milliseconds. Mm -hmm. and, and because it's so active, it can be fatigued out very quickly as well. And just think about your mildly stressful day and how you feel after that and how you're thinking. Well, what if there's a chance that you can become more efficient because you're monitoring it and you let it recover before it gets past that limit. Mm -hmm. When you let it recover, which might not even be that long, it could be seconds to minutes, then you're able to go farther, longer, and at a pace that is uh, doable. And uh, once again, we basically really don't notice it until we've gone too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that dark night of the soul stuff doesn't need to happen to you, <laughs> but that's what it takes sometimes, right? Thank you, Dr. Dave, for being uh, just such a great uh, resource and so wise. Uh, really appreciate every interview that we do. For those of you, again, who haven't seen our prior episodes, we might be at 11 or 12 now, but go check them out. We talk about everything from birth to death, neurological health wise, patient preference of care, taking care of children. Um, reactions to spike proteins, um, things that matter in your day-to-day -day life. And uh, we'll be talking about in future interviews, things that are outcoming about um, the side effects of the vaccines. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that uh, and come check us out again at masteryourlife.ca. Everyone, love yourselves, love each other, mind your minds. That's all for us. Bye for now. Thank you for being a part of our program today. Master Your Life is a presentation of Leah Mattinson Enterprises, Inc. Join us next time on Master Your Life, helping you to discover the very best of you.